Let's start part three of our extremely high yield review for the USMLE Step 3 and the USMLE Step 2 CK. Amaurosis fugal is an extremely high yield condition that you can see on your USMLE Step 3 CCS cases or even in your MCQs. So let's take a closer look at this. So patients typically present with sudden and transient monoocular blindness. So they can also have a carotid brewery and you can diagnose this condition by doing a carotid Doppler. In order to treat these patients, you can use carotid and arterectomy. So if a patient presents with paralysis of upward gaze, diplopia, and signs of increased intracranial pressure, you want to suspect a penaloma or penaloma. I'm so sorry if I'm like butchering these pronunciations. I'm not feeling so good today, but let's continue. The most common malignant brain tumor in children is a medulloblastoma. And this is typically seen in children between the ages of 5 to 9 years old. And they have signs of increased intracranial pressure, such as headache, nausea, and vomiting, as well as gait ataxia or incoordination. And you can treat these patients with surgical resection radiation, and chemotherapy. Examiners love to test hematology concepts by using the up-down arrows, and this is for all USMLE exams, step 1, step 2, and step 3. So it's very important to note that if you see lab reports that show a patient with a macrocytic anemia, a low red blood cell distribution width, and target cells, and they're Southeast Asian, you need to think about thalassemia. So th thalassemia occurs due to uh, mutations in one or two alpha globin allele alleles or one beta globin allele. So this can result in thalassemia minor. Off note, you'll also see normal platelets and white blood cells. Hemoglobin electrophoresis can be used to distinguish between alpha and beta thalassemia minor. So let's say that you have a newborn with feeding difficulties, they're lethargic, they have constipation, they have large fontanelles, hypotonia, hypothermia, and macroglossia. You want to think about congenital hypothyroidism. Bacterial meningitis. So these patients present with fever, headache, altered mental status, and nuchal rigidity. If you do a CCF evaluation for these patients, you'll see an increased opening pressure, increased leukocyte count with a prominent neutrophil count, increased protein concentration, and decreased serum glucose concentration. So strep pneumo is the most common cause of bacterial meningitis in children and young adults. So Lyme disease occurs due to a sparachy called or sparachy called Borrelia, and typically these patients can have erythema chronica migrans, which is basically the target-like lesion. And we'd want to treat these patients with doxycycline or amoxicillin. So you can use this in the early stages. It's important to note that amoxicillin is preferred in pediatric patients. Because remember, tetracyclines such as doxycycline can cause adverse effects such as teeth discoloration in pediatric patients. If Lyme disease is in the later stages or disseminated, then this is when ceftriaxone is indicated. So this study is extremely high yield for you to know. So I would suggest reviewing the mechanism of actions of doxycycline and amoxicillin. If you want to see a review video on antibacterials or antimicrobials, then let me know in the comment section below. But let's continue. Growing pains. So this is a common cause of musculoskeletal pain in children. They'll present with bilateral pain in the thighs or calves, and it's typically worse at night. Physical exam is practically normal and does not show any evidence of any bone or joint inflammation and patients don't have any impairment of their physical activity. However, it's important to note that their pain is worse at night, but it typically resolves by the morning. 
So the treatment is symptomatic with like massages, acetaminophen, and reassurance. Neuroblastomas are neoplasms of the neuroendocrine cells of the sympathetic nervous system. These patients can present with abdominal pain, abdominal distension, failure to thrive, weight loss, and obstaclonus myoclonus syndrome. So when you do the physical exam, you'll note a firm nodular mass that crosses the midline. And you can also note diastolic hypertension. It's very important to know that for neuroblastoma, the mass crosses the midline because oftentimes questions that test you on neuroblastoma also have Wilms tumor as an option. So Wilms tumor does not cross the midline and for neuroblastoma, however, they do cross the midline. So to diagnose neuroblastoma, you will note a increased catecholamine metabolites in the serum and urine. And make over amplification is another high yield concept, and yes, it is tested on the US only step 3 and the US only step 2 CK. If you do histology, you'll note small round blue cells that may form rosette patterns. Neuroblastoma can also metastasize to the bone and skin. In order to treat cases of cardiogenic shock or refractory hypotension, you can administer IV dopamine. So let's say that a patient presents with intermittent episodes of swelling of the skin, the face, and lips. Um, you want to suspect a hereditary angioedema. And this is, this can be a autosomal dominant condition or due to de novo deficiency in C1 esterase inhibitor. So in patients with her hereditary angioedema, they have an overactivation of the complement system overproduction of bradykinin, and decreased C4 complement concentration. Vaccines is very, 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 very high yield um, for your shelf exams, for step 2 CK and step 3. Uh, two high yield points that I want to uh, bring out here is that adolescents should receive the HPV vaccine, meningococcal vaccine, and Tdap vaccines. So let's say that you have a 16 year old and, you know, they are presenting due to like a wellness visit and the question is like, hey, what vaccine should they receive? Um, these are the ones that you would want to give. HPV is a double stranded DNA virus and it can cause genital warts. So it's important that you commit this to memory because they can ask microbiology questions such as this. Okay, so anatomy. For the Yosemite exams, they love to test you on the upper extremity anatomy such as axillary nerve, radial nerve, and uh, median nerve, but they also like to test you on the lower extremity as well, as well as some kind of random anatomy points that you need to know. Um, one of them is the lymph node drainage. I have a high yield video about lymph node drainage so that you can check that out if you want to. But one of the high yield points is that the tip of the tongue drains to the submental nodes. So let's say that there's a question about a patient with cancer of the tip of the tongue and they ask where it would drain to. It would drain to the submental nodes, which are, which are level one nodes. Another uh, concept that they like to test is below the dentate line, Anal cancer drainage is to the superficial inguinal nodes. And above the dentate line, drainage is to the superior rectal nodes, then to the iliac nodes. Ovarian tumors are also extremely high yield. Latex cells make testosterone. So if a patient has a latex cell tumor, this can cause masculinization. Granulosa cells make estrogen. Granulosa cell tumors can lead to precocious puberty in young girls. And teratomas are the ones that look extremely weird. They have teeth, hair, fat, just anything weird um, that you can picture. They are in teratomas. And if you want to continue learning more high yield concepts for the Yosemite Step 2 CK and the Yosemite Step 3, then all you have to do is click this video right here.